The next word is Ajuni. So, in the same way as Akal is no death, Jorn means life, Ajoni is no life, beyond life. Jorn is generally used for births, so it's not saying it's lifeless, not saying there's no aliveness to it. It's beyond lives. Journey. Beyond lives. No lives. Or no births. Something about the pronunciation. Sometimes we hear people pronouncing it as ah journey. Ah journey. Like there's supposed to be a kanna there, but there isn't, so we don't pronounce it ajuni, it's ajuni. So just to be mindful there, sometimes we pronounce it with an extra kanna which isn't there. Interestingly, in Guru Granth Sahib Ji, the way that this particular word is spelt only appears like this in the Mool Mantra. Every other place where this is written in Shabads is written a journey. So here the pronunciation is a journey. In Barney, in Shabads, it will be pronounced a journey. So it's interesting that this spelling only appears in Mool Mantar. And Mool Mantra appears several times throughout Barney, every time a new rag is started. They mean exactly the same thing, but in Shabads you will see it as a journey. In Mool Mantra you'll see it as a journey. And beyond birth, no birth, no reincarnation. And what Guru Nanak Dev Ji is trying to allude to is that God isn't something to be born inside you. It isn't something for you to obtain. It isn't just another brick to add to your identity. It isn't a new development inside you. It isn't something that wasn't there before and is there now or will be there in the future. No birth is needed for it to exist within you. It's already there. It's permanently there. In Japji Sahib, it says, Thapya na jai. Thap means constructed. Thapya na jai. Kita na hoi. It hasn't ever been created. And the same is true within you. It's not something to be created within you. If you go back to the light analogy, the light has always shone in you. You and the light are the same thing. So, thapya na jai, kita na hoi. It is not to be constructed. It is not to be obtained. It's not to be made. It's not to be shone brighter. Ape aap niranjan soi. It's already there. Ape aap. It's already there. Anjan is a word used for maya. Niranjan means without maya. It is the being inside you that has no attachments. It's the being inside you that has let go of all the bricks. Ape aap, it's already there in its desireless state within you. Ape aap niranjan soi. So, when you go on this spiritual path, 
Sometimes we talk about finding God, I want to find God, as though it's something that you've never seen before, a fruit that you've never tasted before, something new for you to obtain. But this isn't something for you to implant within you. It's not something that needs to be cultivated, it's not something that needs to be nurtured. It's simply to be discovered or rediscovered as something that's already there behind all the noise of your life. It's the one that gives the bricks any meaning. Otherwise the bricks don't mean anything. It's the one that's applying meaning to that. It's the light that gives light to the room. You see, as soon as the light is switched off, as soon as a person dies, it becomes an empty fortress, an abandoned mansion. You walk into a house that hasn't been lived in for a long time, and no matter how beautiful it used to look, it doesn't look any, any beautiful anymore. It doesn't have the charm that it used to have. What is it that gives it that charm? Life gives it that charm. When somebody dies and you look at their body, what is it that's missing? The body is still there. They could still be wearing the same clothes and all the jewellery, but something's missing. The life within them is missing. So that which gives meaning to your whole body, to your mind, that which actually makes it come alive, is that light which is already on inside you. It's the light bulb that shines on everything else, that actually gives the everything else meaning. You can't see and appreciate a beautiful piece of art if it isn't for the light that actually illuminates it. You can't see a piece of art in the dark. So you're not a being where the light is switched off. The very fact that you're alive means God's light the light of life is already switched on inside you. So that's why it's not something to be born. And when you were born, when your body was born, life wasn't born, life was simply given. There was a light bulb and around it the fortress was constructed. The light bulb was always there, the light was always there. So you are, in your true state, a Junni. You yourself are beyond birth. We like to think of a Junni as, I will gain enlightenment in this life and I will not have to go to another life. But again, that's your mind in the future. Right now, you are a being that has never been born. And when we talk about, I was born, what we actually mean is the day the body came into this earth. That's really what we mean. But when was life planted into that body? Was it in the mother's cell already? Life was already there. <coughs> So what you are is not limited to your body. You know, if I asked you, tell me more, you might have told me I am 25 years old or whatever your age is. You might have given me an age. And what you mean by that is this body is 25 years old. You aren't 25 years old. This body started to be constructed 25 years ago. But the reality is that you are actually more than that age. You're not even as old as you think you are. 
your physical body is actually older than you think it is. It's actually much older. What made your physical body? Where does life come from? Birth comes from the merging of two cells. And one of them is the female egg. Interestingly, inside a woman, inside the ovary, are all the eggs that she will ever have. Every egg that you will ever have is inside you already. So for those of you who've yet to have children, that child is already sitting inside you. That egg is already there. It's already born. And science has revealed that when you were inside your mother's womb and you were being formed, when you yourself were a fetus, one of the first things to be created within the female fetus is the ovaries. And within the female fetus ovaries are all the eggs. So understand this. Before you were born, you already existed in your mother. So let's say your mother was 20 years old when she had you. Your cell that created you was already there for those 20 years before you were born inside your mother. And when your mother was being formed as a fetus inside your grandmother, that egg that created you was already there. So the egg that created you first started in your grandmother. So you tell me how old are you? Because you weren't born the day that you physically came into this world. You're at least two generations older than you think you are. Your physical body was in your mother and when your mother was being developed in your grandmother. So how old are you? You don't even know how old you are. All you know is when the first brick got laid, according to your understanding. But most people in this room are at least a hundred years old. So what do you know about your birth? You know very little about what your physical body is, let alone how old your light is. And they say that everything that we see around us in the universe started from the Big Bang. So imagine the Big Bang created the universe. It created gases. Gases got together and they solidified and they became energy. Energy got solidified into rocks. Rocks became planets. Planets collided with other planets and created new ones. And within those planets, life was created. So what you are, your physical body is reliant on this planet, and this planet is reliant on the Big Bang. You are cr a creation of the Big Bang. A physical part of you existed when the Big Bang first started. So how old are you? You are as old as creation yourself. Your actual body is actually nothing more than a particle of star. Did you know you're a star? You're a star. Not in the ego-affirming way. We don't see ourselves as that. We see ourselves as just the bricks that we understand. 
What I'm saying to you is the very bricks that you lay down as the foundation of who you are are dependent on other bricks. So when you start digging a little bit deeper, you realize that actually that brick had to have come from somewhere. Where did it come from? So you are far older than the fortress that you've built around you. So and that's just talking about your physical body. Your physical body alone, you can't ever actually put a time frame on that. You existed inside, you're a creation of your mother and your father. So you existed inside your mother and your father. So think about how old your mother and father were when you were born. You're at least as old as they are. But they existed in their grandparents. And they existed in their grandparents. So when you say, I am this many years old, all you're doing is showing me a brick. And I can show you that that brick actually came from a bricklayer. And it came from cement. And it came from sand. And it came from water. So that brick alone needed the creator of those bricks. Your identity, your physical body alone is far older. So you really have no understanding of your birth. And this is what the word Ajuni is alluding to. Your birth is an illusion. Your birth is the culmination of a lot of things that had to happen in order for you to be born. So you don't know anything about yourself. But what you do know is from the moment that you began to be born, the clock started ticking. And the day you started life, you started taking one step closer to death. So you, you were never more alive than you were the day that you were born. Every day after that, you are actually getting closer and closer and closer to death. You were the most alive the day you were born. Everything else is just a little bit closer to death. You're less alive. Every birthday that you celebrate, you're celebrating a shortening of life, not an elongating of life. It's heading in one direction only. So you're not celebrating birth. And what birth would you celebrate? Because you don't know when you were born. When was your cell created? You don't know. So your birthday is another brick, is another illusion that you hold on to. I am this many years old. No, you're not. You're far older than that, so what are you celebrating? What are you holding on to? I've turned 18, I've turned 21. Society is reinforcing certain messages. Gurbani is reinforcing a different message. You're much older than you think you are. But within this body that you don't know how old it is, there is a light. And that light itself isn't associated with the day your body was born. If you close your eyes and you look at what you say, I, I am this person, you'll notice that that I am is the same I am that was there when you were 10 or 12 years old. It's the same person that's there. It's the same I am. And that's the bit that's truly alive. And if you spend more time looking at that, what is this thing called I? What is this thing that is alive? You won't actually be able to define how old it is. That is the changeless being inside you. That is the timeless being inside you. The bit that's alive. 
अचूनी वी देन गो ऑन टू सैपंग सैपंग comes from a sanskrit word swayambhu swayambhu it's a sanskrit word that means self illuminating swa self self illuminating self reliant self existing self sustaining we come across this word in jap sahib chatur chakravarti chatur chakra bhukte swayam bhav subham so think about the analogy of light any light that you know any worldly light is dependent on an energy source the light bulb can't be on without electricity constantly feeding it a candle the flame of a candle can't just burn on its own it needs the wick and it needs the fuel whether it's wax or an oil of some sort even the sun is running off its reserve fuels that's why they talk about the sun cooling down and the sun will eventually die out even the sun isn't permanent it's a light that's dependent on something else here gurbani is talking about that light inside you that life inside you isn't dependent that light inside you isn't dependent on anything a light that has nothing feeding it it is just alive it's self burning it needs no one to do anything it's already just there and this life this oneness this ik this omkar god energy force is reliant on nothing it is self reliant self illuminating and more importantly it needs nothing and it certainly needs nothing from you it wants nothing from you people think that god want wants you to pray God has no desires has no wants God needs nothing from you from mankind it doesn't need your prayer it doesn't need your sacrifices it doesn't need your commitment it doesn't need your offerings it doesn't need your charity Bhagat Ravidas ji says in the arti tera kiya tujhe kya arpo that which you have created how can i offer to you you know you go to the gurdwara and you think you're doing something by giving money like you're making an offering or you put flowers where did those flowers come from did you give birth to those flowers did you make something that you can give god or was that flower happily singing in the field you went and chopped the flower off took its life away and then placed it in front of its creator and the creator might turn around and say to you it was perfectly fine in the field where it was who are you to cut that flower take its life away and then give it to me like you're giving me an offering why take something that's singing with life cut it away from life and then place it in front of someone like you're giving them a present in some cultures they might see that as a bad omen you're giving me something dead 
Give me a plant that's singing with life. Why give me a dead flower? And then you place some flowers in front of the Guru and you say, I'm making an offering to you. Tera kia tujhe kya arpon. It's your doing, it's your creation. What can I give to you? Bhagat Rav Das Ji ends that line by saying, Naam tera tuhi chavar tolare. The only offering I can give you is a naam. But he says, Naam tera, it's your name. All I can do is wave it above you, like a fan. I can fan your name to you. It isn't even a name that I can give you. Even your Naam Simran isn't an offering to God. Don't think you're giving God anything. Don't think you're offering anything special. Because what you're doing there is creating an ego. An ego that says, I pray to God. That's a nice little brick that I'll put in my fortress. You're one of those people that doesn't pray. I'm one of those people that does pray. So you create another brick, another ego, another identity. So don't even believe that you are giving something. Gurbani says, Aap japai jape so now, aap gawai so har gun gao. When you allow me to sing, then I sing your name. When you allow me to say your name, then I say your name. I cannot even produce a word without the tongue that you've given me, without the breath that you've given me, without language which you've given me. So, a being that is so self-contained within itself, within its own perfection, so perfectly complete, doesn't require anything of you. So no religion can claim to be the sole direct route to God. Like they have the monopoly. Like they're the ones who know how to get there. It doesn't require you to join a religion. It's already there within you. That's why Barney says, Kat kat vasa. It's in each and every one of you. It's in every heart. I recognize my own light, then I can see the light in everyone. Where's the question of religion? It doesn't require you to do anything. It exists in you. It is you. It belongs to you. That light bulb doesn't require a religion for you to see the light bulb. What religion will you join that makes you see your own light? No religion you join is going to do the work for you. Even if you join a religion, even if you go very far within that religion, ultimately it's your light that you have to recognize. Divinity is yours. Your divinity, your divine light needs nothing from you. Because it's not external to you. So there's nothing external that you can feed it. It, it's not a flame that, that if you throw more to it, it'll burn brighter. It's already there. It's not limited to any particular religion. Sikhi doesn't own the monopoly on this. It's there in everyone. It doesn't require any practice from you. It doesn't require you to look a certain way. It's already there within you. Just by changing the way you look, cutting your hair or shaving your head to be a monk or growing your hair to be a Khalsa isn't going to change the fact that you still have to go and find that light. Just growing your hair doesn't make you find the light. It stops you cutting your hair 
it stops you holding on to the attachment of I must look a certain way to conform to society but it doesn't make you find the light that's still an effort that you have to do on top of growing your hair so at this point I just want you to acknowledge that it's already there it's born within you it's already there it doesn't need a special language, it doesn't need special words, it's there. You don't have to do anything for it to exist, it's already existing within you. So the question might arise, well then does it mean I don't have to do anything? Can I just be myself? Can I just be a good person? Is that enough? If it's already there within me, if all that I need is just to recognize my own light, if it needs nothing from me, in fact, if it is me and it's the one doing everything, it's the karta puruk, why don't I just sit back and relax? What's there to do? What you need to do is to break your attachment to your identity. And that's something that isn't easily done on your own. And that's something that needs practice. And that's something that needs rehat. A system. A system that works. A system that's been molded by people who've done that system before. And a rehat is nothing more than a practice to let go of those bricks and to find the light and recognize the light. By doing the rahat, it isn't a guarantee. And by doing the rahat, it shouldn't become another identity that you place upon you. Because you could do all the things that are expected of you and follow every rahat, but still not break any attachments. You still may be holding on to that rahat as though it was another attachment, another identity of yours. Rehat is needed to break away from this mind. Mind is holding on to everything. This is mine, this is mine, this is mine. All these things that you create, they create your thoughts, your thinking. You very rarely think about something that isn't associated with one of those bricks. Every thought that you have in your head is associated with something to do with you. Even the things that you care about, the things that you like, they're just other bricks. And what you do is you spend all of your day in your mind just polishing each brick and thinking about each brick and managing each brick. That's what your day is all day, every day. Your mind is just a continuous conversation of just associating with different things, different things that you've held on to. Rehat is a way to break from that mind. To break from the habit of being in your mind all the time and polishing those bricks every day and maintaining those attachments every day. Rehat isn't something for you to cling on to anything. Rehat isn't something for you to be attached to. Rehat is for you to break your attachments. Why does it ask you to wake up early in the morning? It says, don't be attached to sleep. Why does it ask you to break from certain things to eat and drink? It says, don't be attached to tastes. Not that you get attached to other tastes. You know, an argument that people use for vegetarianism is they say that those who eat meat are only eating them out of swad. Are you telling me that all the vegetarians are eating tasteless food? Or are all the vegetarians in reality, are we all attached to certain swads as well? But in our mind what we've done is we've said that these are acceptable swads and those swads are not acceptable. So give me a nice plate of chili paneer. Give me a nice chocolate. So vegetarians we become attached to certain tastes and we say, yeah, but aren't we, aren't we nice and good people? All you meat eaters, you're the bad people because you're doing something bad and we're doing something good. 
That's a nice brick that I'll place in front of me. I'm a vegetarian. Don't be fooled that by becoming a vegetarian that you think you're becoming more holy. Your attachment to vegetarianism is nothing more than an attachment. The reason you were supposed to give things up was to break attachment to tastes. But what you've done is broken attachment to certain things and built another attachment to things. Sikhi is about discipline, but for one reason only, not that you attach yourself to that discipline and you create a hankar that I'm a disciplined person. That's where you see these very mean, horrible spiritual people, so-called spiritual people, so-called amritaris, whose life was supposed to be about the swath of amrit, yet they are mean people. Because they look down on everyone else, because they hold on to their bricks saying, I'm a spiritual guy. Your ego is hard enough to break. The spiritual ego is the hardest one to break, because that ego is the approved ego. That's the identity that they believe is allowed. Rehat was introduced to help break your identity not to create more things for you to cling on to. Being a good person in life is fine, be a good person. But it's not going to help you break those attachments and it's not going to help you recognize the light. The light doesn't need anything from you. But you need Rehat in order to find those things. Otherwise, you're just going to be in your mind all the time, and your mind is just going to be outward looking all the time. You need to find a system to change that around, to be inward looking. A simple analogy that I like to use is, imagine buying a state-of-the-art camera. And you never read the manual. So imagine you have this really flashy camera and it can do a thousand things and you show off to all your mates, my camera can do all these things. You say, go on then. I don't know how to do it. I never read the manual. So what you do with this really expensive piece of equipment is you just about manage to take some photos. But you're really pleased that you've got this really expensive equipment. Your life is like that. A really refined, beautiful tool that you've never read the manual how to use. Guru Granth Sahib Ji is a manual for your life. It tells you how to get the most out of it. And it tells you the pitfalls. You've got these things called Kaam Krod Lob Mohankar. It tells you what to do with them, how to avoid them. Now, you could be really egotistical and say, I don't need someone to tell me what to do. I don't need to read the instructions. No, you don't. In reality, you don't need to read the instructions to use that camera. You'll probably be able to look at it, switch it on and take some photos. You'll probably be able to do that. And that's what we're doing with our life. We walk around with an ego saying, I don't need a guru to tell me what to do. I'll, I'll figure it out for myself. You will be able to figure it out for yourself, but you won't be able to get even 10%. You won't be able to use even 10% of the features of what you could be using in yourself. So imagine you're walking around with the most sophisticated equipment, that is this body, this mind, this life, this potential. You're walking around with the most sophisticated thing, and you've never learned how to use it. And that's what we're all doing. Read the instructions. That's what Bani is. That's what Guru is. But as soon as you do that, it feels like somebody telling you what to do. I don't need someone telling me what to do. You see, the Guru isn't telling you what to do with your life. The Guru isn't telling you what to do with your camera, it's simply pointing out all the features of the camera. What you choose to go and take photos of is up to you. 
How you choose to live that life is up to you. But be aware of all the features within you. So, imagine a manual of a camera. It doesn't tell you what to go take pictures of. It tells you how to make the best of that camera. Then when you go to take photos, you'll know how to best use it. And when you read Barney, it doesn't tell you how to live your life. It tells you all the features that when you go out and live your life, you'll know the best way to do it. If somebody presents a situation in front of you, because you've read the manual, you'll know how not to get into anger. How not to get into attachments. How not to get into desires. Into greed. It'll tell you how to do those things. It's not telling you what to do with your life. It's not telling you what kind of house to live in. Whether to live on a mountain or on the beach. It, go do what you want. The Guru doesn't tell you what to do. It tells you how best to do whatever you want to do. And you can carry on taking the pictures without reading the manual, but what we do is we keep taking those pictures and then we wonder why they don't come out like the professional pictures. Because it, you haven't spent the time to learn that, the effort it takes to learn that. And there's a very simple rule to live by. If you want to achieve something you've never achieved before. If you want results you've never seen before, you have to do something you've never done before. If you want results you've never seen before, you have to do something you've never done before. If you carry on doing the same things as before, you're going to get the same results. If you keep taking the same photos in the same way, you're going to get the same pictures. If you're going to keep addressing life in the same way as you've always done, you're going to get happy and sad. You're going to get angry and frustrated. And then you'll wonder, I don't want to be frustrated. I don't want to feel like this. I don't want these horrible feelings. I don't want to feel disconnected. I want to feel connected. But if you don't follow the manual, you're going to carry on making the same mistakes. So don't see the Guru as someone imposing in your life. He's simply getting the best out of you. Once you learn how to get the best out of you, you can walk on any path. That's why Sikhi does not restrict you to a particular path. Guru Nanak Dev Ji didn't go all around the world and say, you're a Buddhist, leave it, come join me. You're a Hindu, leave it, come join me. You're a Muslim, leave that, they're all wrong. Leave all those paths. What did Guru Nanak Dev Ji do? If you're a Muslim, let me show you how best to be a Muslim. If you're a Hindu, let me show you how best to do it. If you're a Sikh, let me show you how best to be a Sikh. Make no mistake, Guru Nanak Dev Ji and Guru Granth Sahib Ji isn't a manual for how to be a Sikh. It isn't a Sikh, it's a manual. It's a manual for life, for you that applies to everyone. Sikhi isn't a religion. A Hindu who follows the Guru's teaching can be a Sikh. Pai Mardana, what will you call him? Will you call him a Muslim or will you call him a Sikh? Kabirji, what will you call him? A Muslim, a Hindu, a Sikh? That's why Guru Nanak Dev Ji was called Hindu Ada Guru Musliman Kapir. Because everybody, when they listen to Guru Nanak Dev Ji, they say, yeah, this guy is telling me how to be a better person in my own way. Guru Granth Sahib Ji is not a manual for Sikhism. It's not creating a new religion. It doesn't need religion. Guru Granth Sahib Ji doesn't need you to call yourself Mr. Singh or Miss Kaur. It doesn't need that. It says, call yourself what you want. Grow your hair, cut your hair, shave your head. Eat meat, don't eat meat. Do this, do that. 
wake up, don't wake up, say this prayer or don't say this prayer. It's not dependent. That's why Barney says, Koi bole Ram Ram, koi khudai. Koi seve gusanye, koi alai. Some call it Ram, some call khuda, some say God. At what point did Guru Nanak Dev Ji say, that's wrong? All of you are supposed to say, why Guru? Are we meant to hold on to, I am a Sikh? Or are we supposed to, Guru Maniyo Granth? Are we supposed to follow the Guru? When the Guru is, is saying, discard all attachments. If you're attached to this idea that I am a Sikh, then believe it or not, that's just another brick. What that brick says is that's the Sikh colored brick. That's a brick that has the word Sikh written on it. Your brick has the word Christian written on it. Your brick has the word Islam written on it. My brick has the word Sikh written on it. I'm different to you. What are you doing there? When Barney is saying that we're all the same, sab gobind hai, sab gobind hai, gobind bin nahi koi, everybody is God, everyone is the same, we're all part of the oneness, you're creating divisions. Your mind is creating divisions. So follow the Guru, and the Guru tells you, break all attachments. The reason you grow your hair is not to create an attachment, it's to break the attachment from the body. The reason you cut your hair is because you're attached to the way you look. When you stop being attached to the way you look, you just let the body go, and the body will do this. It'll just grow. It's like a flower who, that you keep cutting off, and it tries to grow another flower. And then you cut that one off, saying, it doesn't look right. I don't like all these flowers. I keep chopping them off, and the flowers keep coming back. Well, why don't you just leave it alone then? When you leave it alone, that's what happens. It grows. It's a letting go. It's that, I care about what I look like, brick, that you let go. So don't see Rehat, rules of Sikhi, as imposing rules. They're there to help break your attachments. Otherwise, you can put a beautiful dastar on your head and you create a lovely attachment. My pug's better than your pug. That's a nice little brick that I'm going to place in front of me. I've got the best pug. I've got the longest hair. Isn't that just another attachment? So, Sepang is a reminder that do what you want. Do all these things or don't do these things. There's something already there inside you. Everything that you need is already here. You know, we talk about finding God. Where is God? It's already here. It's because we use this word God that we get confused. Where's life? Life's here right now. You might actually follow what I'm saying and take it to a conclusion that says, you know what, I'm done with this sicky stuff. It's too hard. Why do I need to do it? It's already there. God's already there. I've tried it, I grew my hair, I did all the nithnim, I did all the part, I went to all the Keetan programs and I didn't really find it. This Sikhi stuff doesn't work. You might actually say, but that guy said, it's already there within you, so I don't need to do anything. You might say that life was a lot easier before I got into Sikhi. Before I got into Sikhi, I had a bit of freedom in my life. Now there seems to be a lot of rules in my life. So, religion is restricting me, it's holding me back. And this is the difference between spirituality and religion. Religion tries to bind you down with rules and regulations. But this isn't about rules and regulations. When you look at it from a spiritual perspective, spirituality Taram, it's actually setting you free. 
Because what you do with that wall that you build around you, some might call it a fortress, some might call it a mansion, but it's a wall that you can't get out of. And what do you call a building that you can't get out of? Prison. What you've actually done is you've built a prison around you. Rather than being a light that shines infinitely in every direction, you've built a wall around you that can only be shone within those four corners of those walls. So you've built a prison around you, you haven't built a fortress around you. So this identity that you're holding on to, religion looks like it's adding more bricks, more weight onto the wall. Dharam and the Guru is breaking those. It's setting you free. And when you get set free, you'll realize that there was no I who did all that effort. It wasn't me that was doing all that effort. And that's where it comes to Prasad. The one letting go of those bricks isn't your doing, and that's Prasad. That's grace.